Welcome to our AOSpine North America webinar on lumbar interbody fusion open versus minimal invasive options. My name is Roger Hartle. I'm the moderator tonight. I'm a neurosurgeon at Cornell in New York City. And it's my great pleasure to have a fantastic faculty here assembled for you tonight to discuss this hopefully interesting and important topic for, for your practice. I want to thank AOSpine Chris Riley, especially, was here with us tonight, and uh, Mr. Costello, and uh, we'll get started. So first, I'll, I'll share a few housekeeping slides with you, and then we'll proceed with the actual webinar. We have Alex Vaccaro here, who most of you, all of you probably know. He's, uh, uh, he's an orthopedic surgeon in Philadelphia. He's the president of Rothman uh, Spine, Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. And we have Dean Chow here from UCSF, who is a neurosurgeon, who is uh, a specialist when it comes to spinal deformity surgery, MIS surgery. Uh, so thanks, Alex, and uh, thanks, uh, Dean, for being here with us tonight. We'll uh, uh, go through the disclosures, uh, my disclosures, Dean's disclosures, Alex's disclosures, take a few slides. But uh, I know that he's not going to be affected by by, by his conflicts, of course. The learning outcome, uh, upon completion, you should be able to appreciate the current indications for open spinal interbody fusion surgery, recognize the current indications for minimal invasive spinal fusion surgery, and know the limitations of both. That is really the goal that we're trying to achieve by discussing MIS and open fusion technologies. And, and why are we doing that? Because MIS is a rapidly evolving subspecialty within spine. There are a lot of great things happening in MIS, but there are also limitations, especially younger surgeon. And as you kind of embark on your journey into MIS, you have to understand the limitations. You have to understand the indications and you have to understand when open surgery may actually be a better option than minimum basis spinal surgery. So that's what we're trying to do tonight by uh, having a, a diverse faculty here and by showing you some of the didactic features of surgery, but also some interesting cases, hopefully. So we'll start with uh, an introduction into MIS. I'll show you, I'll talk a little bit of, about MIS T-lift surgery. And we'll have Alex gonna talk about open surgery, pros and cons. He's gonna show a case that he actually did today, as I just found out, which is great. Uh, Dean Chow uh, is an expert when it comes to MIS, especially lateral oblique surgery. He's gonna talk about that and show us a case and then we'll go on and discuss. Uh, we have more cases if, if there's more time, and then we'll summarize and, and, and wrap up at about 9, 9.15 uh, Eastern time here. So uh, if you have questions, and, and please don't be shy, if you have questions, use the, que the, the question and answer box, don't use the chat box, but you can submit questions, we'll monitor your questions or comments, and we'll try to address those over the course of the webinar. So I'll get started. I'll talk about lumbar interbody fusion, MIS versus open, and I'll talk about uh, the MIS options. Where does MIS come from? What's the role currently of MIS? And how does that translate, translate especially when it comes to MIS uh, T-lift surgery? Now, since it's an AOSpine uh, webinar, I want to mention that uh, we have been working on MIS uh, on a curriculum for minimum invasive spinal surgery within AO. We formed an expert group a number of years ago with eight fantastic surgeons all over the world. We've been trying to define MIS and also give surgeons kind of a uh, walkthrough through some of the basic MIS procedures and help them in, in acquiring the, uh, uh, you know, the skills and the techniques to become good MIS surgeons. But a, a good definition of MIS, and this is really based on consensus, that it's a suite of technology dependent techniques and procedures that, re that reduces local operative tissue damage and systemic surgical stress, enabling earlier return to function, striving for better or at least the same outcomes as traditional open surgery. So that's, that we're, that's what we're trying to get to. And, and where, where are we? If you, if you look at, if you plot complexity of spinal surgery against invasiveness, and you look at traditional open surgery, you'll see that it, that, that curve uh, goes up pretty quickly in terms of invasiveness. The whole goal with minimal invasive spinal surgery is really to dampen that curve. So to do the same type of operation in terms of surgical outcomes, 
but with a lower degree of invasiveness. And if you look at low complexity operations, such a uh, lumbar disc herniation, there's frankly, there's probably not a huge difference whether you do it open up or MIS. But then if you, if you, if you move towards the right on that curve, when it, once it comes to lumbar spinal stenosis or multi-level lumbar spinal stenosis or spondylolisthesis or, re, or, or operations that require two, three, four lumbar uh, uh, fusion operations, that's really where the benefit zone of MIS currently, in my opinion, is. So a two, three level lumbar stenosis operation, an MIS T lift, or patients that we treat with lumbar interbody, like lateral approaches and combinations of L lift and T lift, those are really, that, that's currently the sweet zone when it comes to MIS. And I think uh, for severe deformity cases, we're still not there in terms of Milner's spinal surgery to really uh, offer patients a reliable, and better option than, than open traditional surgery. So that, 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 that's what I would consider the benefit zone for MIS. But that means also, if you look at the whole spectrum of, of spinal surgery that's being performed, that means that about 75% of spinal surgery nowadays can be done partially or completely with MIS surgery. And what are the components that young surgeons especially have to really look into if they wanna, if they wanna become good at MIS surgery? The number one that we never talk about is really patient selection. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll address that here tonight, especially in Alex's talk. Uh, tools and technology is something that we know a lot about from going to meetings, the microscope, navigation, surgical techniques, teaching and training, uh, research, and finally talent. So those are all the, the components that come into play if you want to become a good minimal invasive spine surgeon, and really a good spine surgeon in general. Uh, obviously, the rationale of minimal invasive spinal surgery is to minimize the injury to, to muscles, soft tissues, and bones, so patients have a faster recovery, go back to work quicker, have less post-operative pain, lower infection rate, and so forth. And if you look at the papers and the books that have been published in MIS, you'll see that virtually every uh, part of the spine nowadays can be approached with minimal invasive spinal surgery. Uh, we have tools, techniques available to address that. Uh, we have to be good at the microscope with navigation. We have uh, percutaneous pedicle screw systems. We have expandable cages, all these techniques and uh, technologies that are important for us to really perform surgery safely and effectively with minimal invasive spine surgery. And then finally, the techniques. And the, the techniques that allow you to really become a good MIS surgeon are always the same. That is the... Uh, the idea that you can perform a unilateral approach for bilateral decompression in the lumbar spine and also in the cervical spine. The idea that by using mental invasive spinal surgery, you minimize iatrogenic instability so you can avoid fusion surgery in a lot of patients. And then finally, once you have to do a fusion operation, you can take advantage of the idea of indirect decompression and deformity correction with expandable cages, with hyperlidotic cages, and so forth. So those are really the, the main technique principles of MIS surgery. Um, tubular surgery obviously is important. Kevin Foley, Rick Fessler, Larry Kuhn, and others in introduced this uh, more than 20 years ago. And that has really become, at least in North America, the mainstay for MIS surgery, for decompression, but also for fusion surgery. I want to show you a case where we can avoid fusion surgery by using MIS decompression techniques intelligently in the right patient. This is a patient without mechanical back pain with spondylolisthesis, with severe lumbar spinal stenosis, no movement on flexion extension films, no mechanical back pain. The question is, does this patient need a fusion? If you decompress this patient with a tubular approach without having to remove a lot of bone or ligamentous structures in the back, you can treat this patient very successfully with a decompression and without a fusion. That's what we did here. Instead of doing a big opening, remove a lot of bone, we do a tubular over the top decompression. And this patient did very, very well. And we do this now on a routine basis in patients who don't have mechanical instability. This patient does really well with just a, uh, with, with just a decompression without a fusion. Now, what about patients though, who need a fusion operation? Patients who have maybe the same MRI scan but they have mechanical instability, they have movement on flexion extension films, well, then we got to do a fusion. And there are a lot of MIS options as well. And ALIF, in my opinion, is, is a great MIS option. There's no muscle disruption at all. These patients do really well. Dean is going to talk about lateral surgery. I'm going to walk you through 
uh, MIS TLIF options. Uh, the way that we currently do this here where I practice, I use a lot of navigation because navigation allows you to uh, really minimize the uh, amount of soft tissue disruption by planning your skin incisions and by being very, very conservative in terms of opening of soft tissues. Uh, we use a navigation system that's integrated with an intraoperative CT scanner. Uh, this is just a case example of a patient who has unstable spondylolisthesis at L4, L5 with severe lumbar spinal stenosis. Uh, this patient had previously a interspinous process spacer uh, which was not, didn't really work and uh, required a, a decompression and fusion. Now, this is a great, in my opinion, a great example for an MIST lift procedure because that patient needs direct decompression. Uh, the MIS curriculum that we have uh, worked on with uh, uh, the, uh, the expert group within AO Spine walks us in a very systematic fashion through an MIST lift procedure, which is really always the same operation if you look at the anatomy. Uh, I use navigation, as I mentioned, so the patient is positioned in prone position. I tape those patients so there's no motion, so the navigation is accurate, and that allows me then to use navigation from the skin incision until the very end of the operation without having to bring in fluoroscopy. I mark the iliac crest on the patient's back, use a reference array on the iliac crest to place the, uh, for, the, for the navigation, and then we start using navigation from the very get-go of the operation. In this case, uh, we do make two uh, skin incisions in the back and I plan the skin incisions using navigation as is shown here on this, on this intraoperative CT scan. Uh, we use a single step pedicle screw system now that allows us instead of navigating five different instruments, like in the old days, we would navigate the K-wire, the awl, the drill. Now we only navigate the pedicle screw. It has an integrated K-wire system. It's a very aggressive pedicle screw tip. We navigate that and, and, and we can insert it into the spine through a small skin incision very, very effectively and very safely. Uh, there are a number of different companies now that have these pedicle screw systems available. We just published our experience with uh, these percutaneous single step navigated pedicle screws. If you can't penetrate the bone because the bone is very hard, we use this uh, navigated um, uh, awl that kind of penetrates the bone and then we go in with the pedicle screw. Then we use navigation for uh, bone, uh, for the harvesting of iliac crest through a little cannulated instrument. We use navigation for that as well. I use uh, iliac crest bone graft for, for these procedures, no BMP. And then once the pedicle screws are in place, I drop the tubular retractor. I, I, I place that with navigation as well. And then according to the PDF that we put together for AO spine for MIS TLIF, we remove the facet joint uh, we drill from the lamina to the pars. I use navigation and also to identify the pars. Uh, all the landmarks that we use for the TLIF procedure, the pedicles, the lamina, the disc space, all that we, we can identify with navigation. It's great for teaching. It's good for cases where you have uh, complex anatomy because the patient has spondylolisthesis or a lot of arthritis. So we go through all the different steps that are um, part of the uh, MIS TLIF procedure. And then finally, we navigate the cage. We put in the cage. We simulate the cage first. We put the cage into the disc space. Ex I use an expandable cage. We expand that then. And if that patient needs an over-the-top decompression, as is shown here, we, we angle the tubular retractor, go over the top, do the decompression. And then finally, uh, uh, get a scan to make sure that uh, everything is in place. This is just uh, the navigation image showing the over-the-top over, over the top bilateral decompression uh, to get into the contralateral foramen. You can confirm that with navigation as well. Over the top is a great movie about this procedure. It's good to watch during COVID. And, uh, and then finally, that's the uh, post-operative x-ray uh, a day later or so uh, in, this, in this particular patient. So that, that was the, uh, that's kind of like the bread and butter TLIF procedure that we do now on a, on a daily basis with navigation, completely navigated. Fusion rates with navigation with, with uh, MIS TLIF are very high, 95% versus 91%. If you compare MIS versus open TLIF, so certainly not worse than open, open TLIF procedure. Uh, complication rates uh, are also comparable, maybe even a little bit lower than open TLIF surgery, especially when it comes to infection rates and cost effectiveness. Uh, there's a, a paper by Kern Sink that was published in Frank Phillips a few years ago that looked at 
cost effectiveness, open versus MIST lift. And they found that MIST lift was associated with the shorter operating room time uh, and uh, lower uh, hospital costs over a 60 day perioperative period compared to open MIST lift surgery. So this was my kind of summary of MIS, some of the basic principles of MIS and really the workhorse, uh, which in my opinion is the MIS T lift procedure. Uh, I'm gonna now give uh, uh, the podium to, to Alex, uh, who's, gonna, who's gonna talk about open surgery. Okay, Raj, thank you. Raj, if you could share the screen. Yeah. Um, I stop sharing, I'll give it to you. Okay. So number one, I, I want to thank everyone. It's an honor to have the opportunity with Roger and Dean to be able to speak at this uh, seminar tonight. And anytime Roger wants someone to embarrass themselves and support archaic dinosaur surgery, he always gives me a call. He says, Alex, I know you're not into MIS. Can you please give this talk? And I always say, Roger, I'm a man of common sense. I do percutaneous pedicle screws. I do robotic surgery, I do lateral approach, but I'm probably not gonna do a revision lumbar decompression for a tube, and I'm gonna tell you why. I have eight friends of mine who have thyroid cancer from radiation. Now, Roger just showed an example of never using radiation, and I have to congratulate Roger. And as our technology increases, and you don't have to bring the fluoroscopy into the operating room, I applaud that. I still think it's foolish that if you can do a small, and I say small, one and a half inch incision, and take down a decompressive and, and decompress severe stenosis in 30 minutes that you would spend two and a half hours with a tube. It just doesn't make any sense to me. So I think what I am is more of sort of a, a synergy of open techniques and minimally invasive techniques. And I'll show a case I did with using robotic surgery without radiation, but I opened it in certain sections because I thought it was too dangerous. The other, other interesting thing, um, I have no complex related to this talk, is that Roger showed data that says using tubular technology, the setup for um, navigation takes a lot less time than walking to the operating room, palpating the iliac crest, feeling the spinous process, making a small, inc small incision and doing a decompression in 20 minutes. So I, I don't believe that, but it's amazing that you can support whatever you want to. And I'm gonna show you data that says almost the exact opposite through the literature in the same period journals that says the, except for infection rate, which is clearly lower, the time is more, radiation is more, complications are greater. You can't get an adequate repair if you have a small tubular um, CSF leak. And I'm speaking from first place, first uh, hand experience that my partner, who was my MIS uh, um, champion at Thomas Jefferson University just came down with a cellular cancer and he uses fluoroscopy all the time. So I just want you to be careful when you're a young surgeon. If you can evolve into this technique like Roger has and avoid radiation, I support it 100%. Just don't start off your career by taking four hours to do a decompression because you're not gonna get patients referred to you. It's not in the patient's best interest to be on the operating table. So um, it makes sense to make the smallest ascension possible. In my career, over 30 years of doing surgery, I've sort of evolved to making a two inch incision for a T uh, lift. And then we sort of joke around with the MIS surgeons. I said, let me, get, let me get a ruler. Two stab wounds on one side, one stab wound on the other. My incision is smaller. So I always sort of laugh at that. Now in other cases, when you're doing percutaneous pedicle screws for deformity, the soft tissue uh, damage is a lot less. But I, I clearly think that MIS allows you to minimize significantly the infection rate. So why do I do? open. I do open because I can repeatedly get the same outcome. I can teach a resident and fellow how to do it safely. Roger said less complications. I'm going to show you literature that says complication rate is higher. You can't get an adequate. It's very difficult to repair in a one and a half centimeter incision, a deep dural tear. And clearly, if you're using navigation like Roger is, you won't have radiation exposure. But the vast majority of people are using radiation to put the guide wire, to put the tube, to manipulate the tube. And you could look at all the studies and radiation, in my opinion, is a horrible thing. So you can look through a small tube or you could do a two and a half inch incision and do an entire T lift. And I would argue that in my hands, I can do a T lift in 45 minutes. That's my standard time for a T lift. 
I'm not bragging. That's what I do. And I do it in 45 minutes. And I sit there and I watch the MIS surgeons in my group do it in 45 minutes sometimes. And they do it. In, then they do it in five hours. Then they do it in 45 minutes. Then they do it in six hours. Then they do it in 45 minutes. But you can consistently through an open approach. And I'm talking about a small open approach. Do it safely. And then if you look at the complication rates, and I, I, I just randomly pulled articles and I have meta-analysis that says the complication rate is probably higher with MIS. The infection rate, in my opinion, MIS is, is lower, but you, you do a two and a half inch incision for a T-lift procedure, your infection rate should be less than 1% nowadays, especially with the vancomycin powder and so forth. And I use it in select cases, the open approach. If it's a simple case, I'll do percutaneous, I'll do robotics. But if you give me a complicated case, and as Roger said today, he sent me an email today, he said, Alex, can you put a case? So this is the case that I had to do today. This was a case done in Florida that I got introduced to telemedicine. This surgeon clearly had no understanding of putting pedicle screws in. Those are not cortical screws. Those are pedicle screws and the cages in the canal. Now, I'm going to do a T-lift. I'm not going to do this through MIS. I got to put pelvic screws and I've got to go. This case I did with robotic surgery today with a small opening at L5S1. And this is what I was left with. These were the screws. It was insane. So this patient, you can go in and you could, with a robot, put the screws per perfectly in place to cages. And that case was a back front back done by 1 p.m. today. And that was using robotic technology, which I have to say, and again, that's a form of MIS. It was so simple. When you have corticated pedicle screws that have been in for a year and a half, and you try to redirect those screws, it's difficult to do. With the right burr, with the robot guidance, it was simple. You just have to put the screws where you have to go. So I support Roger's position. I am a big fan of robotic surgery. I am not a fan of fluoroscopy. So why do I not use MIS? I think the fusion rate is lower. Rod showed a paper and I, I almost, you saw my picture leave the screen because I fell off and got a head injury when he said the fusion rate is higher with MIS. I definitely do not believe it. I see them decorticating the facet joint. When I do, I, I take a tube and I squirt the bone graft on both sides to a small incision. I get a ton of bone graft and you really don't get a ton of bone graft with MIS. So I don't think it's, I don't think the fusion rate's higher. I think the complication rate is probably higher. I think the length of surgery is probably longer. I clearly think the floor, I don't use fluoroscopy. So I think the fluoroscopy time is, is higher. And I think the learning curve is higher. So those are the things that I did. So these are just things that I got from the literature. Complication rates, five times higher in MIS. Others have looked at complication rates in open versus MIS, 33% versus 11, 25%. And it goes on. And if you look at, comp and this is a meta-analysis of the literature, look at the odds ratio favors open for, this is a meta-analysis. This isn't selected. So this is, I just, when, when Rod said, put the case, this, this talk together, this is what I found. And th these st studies clearly show that the complication rate is higher. And then we know fluoroscopy. Now they say you use two times the amount of fluoroscopy in MIS than open. I don't use fluoroscopy at all. I actually just feel the landmarks. I make a small incision, like a sonometer. I put a coker on the spinous process. I know where I'm at. And then I expose it, put my my screws in, I do the t lift two and a half inch incision. So I'm not using fluoroscopy. So I'm looking at the operative times, two and a half hour. I mean, it's crazy how much longer it takes. And remember, a lot of people on this call are young surgeons. When you're starting out, you can say, I am an MIS surgeon to market yourself. And then you walk into an operating for four hours. And guess what? The nurse is not marketing you. They go, this guy takes forever. So be very careful. Start off with a small open, and then you can move to MIS. The learning curve is there. You've learned how to be an open surgeon as a resident or fellow. It takes time to learn how to be an MIS. And again, I support percutaneous pedicle screws. I support robotic surgery. I support all the anterior minimally invasive procedures. I support lateral. I'm just not a big tubular decompressive surgeon because I think that's waste so much time. And I walk into the operating room and I watch my MIS guys do it and they're futzing around with the tube and stuff like that. It drives me, I get dizzy watching them with the tube, putting it in the right place. And if you look at the long-term outcomes, Roger quoted to you before the, that the outcomes were lower. I have studies from saying that says the outcomes are not as good, but we do know through minimally invasive op open discectomy versus MIS, three papers published in level one studies showed that open had less complication rates and better outcomes. 
The TLIF literature and the world is full of MIS TLIF papers. It shows that they're about equal, but in terms of evidence base. So if you look at, if you compare one to the other and you look at complications, readmissions, higher for MIS cases. This is a meta-analysis performed in 2015. Fusion rates, better for open. Again, from the literature. If you look at deformity correction, now here's another thing that, that drives me crazy. If I had a flat back posture and I had a coronal plane deformity, I wanna look normal. I am not interested that the surgeon's gonna do that MIS and give me 20% correction. I need to get the correction, I need to be better. So if you look at everything, if you look at lumbar lordosis, if you look at PILL mismatch, open surgery to a small incision gets you what you need in terms of all the different variables. But I wanna conclude with a, an interesting study of this particular surgeon, he did 75 cases. And then he didn't ask how he felt. He didn't ask the nurses. He asked the patients. He randomized the patients to, and he was a good MIS surgeon. He said, you got MIS, you got open. You got MIS. And then he sent a survey to the patients. And this was the most fascinating thing I saw was asking, whoops, asking the patients what they felt at the end of that procedure. The open patients actually wanted to have their surgery repeated the same way, more so than the MIS. Um, I can do more things after surgery open. I thought I benefited from my surgery. I mean, it's amazing. This is from the patient's perspective after they had, so keep this in mind. These are the facts in the literature. So number one, I'm not against MIS. I support MIS using common sense. If you're gonna be in that operating room for three hours longer, and most studies show time under anesthesia, um, is correlated with how quickly you rehab from surgery. Use common sense. Don't get thyroid cancer at the age of 35. Do what you, th you can do well, and then gradually morph into being Roger Hartle. He is a superb surgeon, and I love watching him speak. I, I just got ideas watching him speak. But don't just jump in and say, I got I to gotta make my practice and my ass because I got to get referrals. Thank you very much. Well, as uh, Alex, uh, uh, great talk. I agree with most of what you said, except for everything you said against MIS, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, you, you, you have a really good point. You know, the indication has to be right. Uh, there's a learning curve. Uh, the literature, I think you can find literature pro and against, but, but you're certainly right about radiation. There was one comment here about BMP, and, and it, it is true. If you look at the literature for MIS T-lift surgery, those surgeons use tons of BMP. And, and, and so, so th th that is a potential criticism. But on the other hand, and I answered that surgeon, if you, if you spend some time with really good end plate preparation, which you have to do with open surgery as well, you can use autograph bone. You don't necessarily have to use BMP. Uh, but uh, but, but uh, I mean, I, I, th I think you're totally right. I mean, you're, there's a learning curve and you have to do it for the right patient at the right time. And the revision case certainly is not, a, the, the case that you show is a great case for open surgery. Um, well, well, we'll move on with Dean, uh, unless Dean, if you have any comments, of course. Uh, Alex, that's a great talk. Can you just, uh, I'm just very curious how you actually uh, fixed that, that case from Florida. Did you, yeah, so I, I, osteotomies I, or what did you, what did you do specifically? Yeah, so, so if you look at where that cage was, it was placed on the right side. So I analyzed exactly. So I came down on the S1 pedicle and I took an osteotome at the S1 pedicle and I, I shaved it. So I got into the space because I had to lift the neural elements above and I was waiting for spaghetti for it to happen. So I came in, I sort of cavitated the S1 super M plate to grit. It was, and it was an expandable cage too, which drove me crazy. So I had to sort of elevate it up and then work around it. And I was finally able to wiggle it out. And if you think you're going to get the gear in an expandable cage hooked up again to, to drop that down, it had bone in it. So it wouldn't drop down. So that's how I was able to get it out. And then all of a sudden, once I got it out, I had the T lift was easy, but a small little incision. And then the robot, and again, I don't want to be an advocate for the robot, but the robot made it easy. You just have to have a really good sharp tip burr so it doesn't scoff. And you just place the screws. Putting, I put 100 millimeter pelvic screws in. It took 30 minutes to do that procedure. I would have, if I did it open, I would have been there forever. 30 minutes to do that procedure, not, not taking the cage up and putting the instrumentation in. And the robotic made it so easy. So it's taking Roger's step where you're controlling the navigation. Now the robot does it. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm becoming a great fan for deformity with robotic surgery.
did, did you have to do multi-level osteotomies or things just moved when you took that, that cage out? The second I took that cage out and I took the osteotome across, it just, it kind of, it kind of, it, it went from a three to a one. Well, well that's great. Dean, you want to, you want to talk about the lateral, lateral surgery? Yes. Uh, thanks, Roger, for inviting me. And, uh, and uh, my name is Dean Chow. We'll talk about lateral now. These are my disclosures. And so when we think about the inner body, as, we, as Roger had discussed earlier, a lift, t lift, lateral, uh, those are the biggies. And when you think about these different types of um, inner bodies, you know, always keep in mind that the anterior column bears 80% our compressive load, and it also has uh, the 90% 90, 90 of the highest uh, area of surface. Uh, the other things that make the inner body really useful, that I find useful, are that it restores disc height, it corrects your alignment and balance, and provides load sharing. And the other reason I use inner body fusion is really this view, which is the intervertebral foramen. And a lot of times you'll see that a laminectomy is not effective because you need to open that foramen. Uh, and if you don't separate bone A off of bone B, you'll never be able to open that foramen. And that's where the role of the inner body comes in. And if you think about this up-down stenosis or foraminal stenosis, why is it so painful? Well, the, it's really painful and disabling because it has the mechanical weight of the, the patient's torso compressing, not just ligamentum flavum. But secondly, it pinches right on the dorsal root ganglia, which is the most sensitive part of the nerve. And really, when you want to look at how much up-down stenosis or foraminal stenosis is, really take a look at those T1 parasagittal views. And right there, you can see where the dorsal root ganglion is compressed. Now, where does this usually happen? It happens in the fractional curve of the scoliosis, the major curve of a scoliosis, lateral listhesis, or as we all know, spondylolisthesis, and then just regular DDD, loss of disc height results in increase in foraminal stenosis. And here you can see this patient with scoliosis, and you can see the lateral listhesis and the up-down stenosis uh, uh, causing pain. Now, how powerful are these indirect decompressions? Uh, and we looked at this, and we looked at what were the predictors of the need for laminectomy after an uh, indirect decompression via either a lift or l -lif. And what we found was it was the change in disc height. That was the most important factor. And it was the cage height minus preoperative disc height. So if you had a huge disc height before, say 10 millimeters or nine millimeters, and you put in a 10 millimeter cage, that didn't really do anything. But if you had a two millimeter disc height and you put an eight millimeter cage in, that dramatically increased the uh, foraminal height and precluded uh, or obviated the need for a laminectomy. So really the change is what you wanna look for when you decide, well, do I need to do a direct decompression? And the lateral approach, lateral approach is basically two approaches, right? One is anterior to the psoas or pre-psoas where you stay out of the plexus completely. You can shallow dock for both of these procedures where basically you look before you put your uh, probe into the disc space to make sure you're not in the bowel, you're not in the nerves, you're not in the vessels. With the anterior to the psoas, you can only do that from the left side. You really can't do that from the right side because of the vena cava. Uh, the trans psoas approach, you can do left or right. Uh, and you want to evaluate the anatomy of the vessels still. And be careful from the right side because the vena cava tends to be on the right. And you really want to evaluate the position of the lumbar plexus uh, to look at these uh, quote unquote Mickey Mouse ears. Here's the approach uh, A lift, T lift, L lift, O lift. And here's why you want to do the anti psoas from the left. You can see the white is the vena cava. And if you try to do an anterior to the psoas on the right side, you're very close to that vena cava. But on the left, you have a, a little bit of a quarter there to do it from the left side. And what do we talk, mean by Mickey Mouse ears? Here's the Mickey Mouse ears. You see the patient on the left has Mickey Mouse ears. The patient on the right does not. 
And you can see if you try to do a trans psoas here, you're going to right through the lumbar plexus because the lumbar plexus is going to go with the psoas. And as that psoas muscle is directed uh, ventrally, so is the lumbar plexus. So you look here, even if you were to try to do an anterior to the psoas approach, it's really not favorable here. It's really difficult to do an anterior approach, uh, anterior to the psoas or pre psoas approach here with the Mickey Mouse ears or very ventral psoas muscles. Here's a normal one. You can see right here, you go anterior to the psoas, even trans psoas, uh, when there are no Mickey Mouse ears. And you have a pretty good corridor to do this. When you do this, the way we do it is we do a uh, shallow docking or direct look, or basically a small incision. And then we look to see the actual psoas muscle and then dock in front of the psoas muscle. Uh, and then the retractor is placed. Uh, and then remember when you do the oblique approach or pre psoas approach, the surgery is still a lateral approach. There's no difference in your cage placement. It is still a lateral cage that is placed. It's just that your approach is anterior to the psoas. Mm -hmm. So when you do your final, tr your trial, your cage, they're all in the true lateral position. And there are many studies showing the lateral approach really helps with your foraminal area uh, uh, from very early studies showing 35% increase in foraminal area, increase in foraminal height, even increase in the central um, canal diameter has been shown to increase with lateral interbody fusion. It also has decent lordosis, not great. Uh, the average numbers are about three degrees per level. Some people will claim even more, maybe six degrees per level if you use a hyperlordotic cage. Um, but generally, the historic number has been about three degrees per level. Now, what about 5-1? So 5-1, you know, the, the people say, well, if you're doing a lateral, then you got to go flip them over and do a hand lift. And what's happening now is that people are moving towards the L5-S1 O-lift or lateral A-lift at 5-1. And basically, it's just an A-lift in a lateral position. Uh, the only difference is that uh, two differences are, number one, is that you're angling towards the right iliac vein. So you have to be very careful that you don't tear the iliac vein on the contralateral side. And it's a little more difficult to release the disc compared to a standard A-lift because that exposure is a little bit tighter. Here you can see this is how we position a lateral A lift. You can see the knees uh, slightly bent so that the, uh, there's not tension there. Mark out the iliac crest, mark out the ribs. Uh, and then there's two lines drawn. One is drawn the L5S1 disc space, one is drawn horizontal, and a, a dot is placed in the ASIS. And generally, about two to three finger breaths anterior to the iliac crest is the incision. We do these approaches with our vascular surgeon who is trained in this approach also. And basically the approach is the same as an A-lift and it goes right into the bifurcation between the great vessels. And there's the small uh, retractor. It's a, it's a very specially designed retractor that where the lower blade goes very, very uh, down towards the floor of the operating room. And really that green blade needs to protect that right iliac vein. And here you can see the view of the trial. And you can see, here's a schematic on the right side showing exactly what the lateral A-lift uh, is doing. And you can see the two different incisions and two different approaches. They're both anterior to the psoas, um, but the 5-1 is basically through the bifurcation. And this is the incision at the L5-S1, and you get pretty good disc height and pretty good correction. You can see here what it looks like with an L5-S1 lateral. So the conclusion is that the lateral can be a good option, but really think about the anatomy um, and it can provide powerful indirect decompression uh, both trans psoas and pre psoas are acceptable depending on surgeon comfort and location of the vessels. So I'm going to go ahead and, and talk about a quick case and, and, and uh, going over our, our lateral uh, session here. This is a 53 year old female who comes in with right buttock pain and leg pain. And the pain radiates down the lateral aspect of the thigh down uh, past the knee. Um, but not really into the foot. And so here you can see these are her long films, uh, uh, standing three foot uh, scoliosis x-rays. And you can see she's got a uh, uh, scoliosis here. And uh, hold on, what did I do there? I just messed it up. And then she's got scoliosis here. Uh, and then you can see here's the close-up lateral. 
Uh, and if you look at if you look at her sacral slope, you can see she's a, a very low Bruce Lee type, right? She's got a very a low sacral slope. So she actually does not need that much lordosis, okay? Uh, and if you look at her scoliosis here, here's a close-up AP of the view. And you can see right here, looking at the T2 sagittal, you can see really at four, five, five, one, there's no central stenosis, three, four, two, three, one, two. She has no central stenosis, really. But if you look here, you can see she's got these, uh, uh, these tight frame in here a little bit. This is not bad. This is left. This is left. And you can see on this side, it's wide open, wide open. But when you look at the right, you can see her right L2 and her right L3 nerves are pinched from the concavity of her scoliosis. And that fits with her pain. Her pain is basically more of an L3 slash L4 distribution. And you can see the L4 is completely, completely stenotic right here. But then you look at L5, it's really uh, nice and open on the right side. And here are the MRI, the axial views, you can see four, this is five one, a small little disc bulge, nothing crazy. Here are four five, she has real no central, really no central stenosis. Three, four, nothing really central. Two, three, nothing really too bad. So she doesn't have any central stenosis. She has foraminal stenosis. She has right side of radiculopathy. She has adult scoliosis. She tries the three, four injection, gives her 60% relief. A second one gives her relief, tries PT, now she wants surgery. So what are the treatment options here? Uh, I don't know, do you guys want to discuss, discuss a little bit how you would handle this in terms of uh, if this patient showed up in your clinic? Uh, Dean, why not, can you hear me? Yeah. So um, I think you make an argument for maybe two, th two three, maybe three, four. So in a, in a case like this, I, I would prefer, would, I would probably do a two level lateral at two, three, three, four and percutaneous screws posteriorly and rely on ind indirect decompression. Uh, I go in the convexity of the curve to access the interspace, uh, five, four, three, four, two, three. Yeah, that's probably what I would do. I, I don't think one, two is a problem. So I do two, three, three, four lateral and then percutaneous screws posteriorly. Yeah, you know, Dean, I, 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 I would agree. I think the pathology is really in the frame and as, as you pointed out so nicely, and also in terms of her, her symptoms, right? She's got, uh, she's got really pain from those nerves being compressed and uh, she doesn't have a lot of central stenosis so there's no reason to do a direct decompression and uh, I think a lateral approach is, is, is this is a poster case for a lateral approach I, I didn't I didn't pay attention now at every level so I apologize but but I I, I agree probably l two three three four maybe four five and uh, and then and then I would do this single stage and then put in you know put screws in a lateral position. And, and, and that, that's something where the robot may also be, I, you know, I use navigation, I don't use the robot, but I, can, I hear that the robot may actually be also uh, really helpful in, 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 in single stage lateral surgery. So that's what I would do. What, what, do you, what do you guys think? You know, I think that some people would, could, could also say, you know, well, this patient has a scoliosis and I'm gonna do T10 the pelvis. What, what are your thoughts when you hear what, things like that? I think that's a waste of time. It's a low Rusli curve, I mean, as you said before, she's pretty well balanced. She's got a, a low lumbar lordosis. So I would, uh, I think that's a waste. I'm a big fan of doing fractional curves in adult degenerative scoliosis, unless you have a significant sagittal plane deformity, which she doesn't. So I think that's a waste of time. Um, it would be too morbid. So keep it, keep it a, sh a short fractional correction. And I think she'd be happy. All right, she's got this nice five one disc space. She's got a lot of foraminal, foraminal height there. So, so, so that shouldn't be an issue either. And, and would you, would you, uh, uh, Roger, uh, agree that uh, you would do uh, only, only T10 the pelvis if it was really a significant sagittal issue or, or some type of major decom decompensation? If, if, if I felt that she was, I mean, I, I really look at the symptoms more. If she had like significant mechanical back pain that I attribute to her deformity then I think maybe she needs more than that done. But I th her deformity in this, I mean, it doesn't seem really that bad, but we see many patients who have a deformity that's much worse than this, right? And, 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 and then it's, it's kind of, uh, maybe the threshold is lower to think about like a big deformity correction operation. 
But even in those patients, if they have if they have primarily foraminal problems, if they have radicular pain from foraminal, then then you know I may may end up doing just a one level or two level lateral just to decompress the foramen and I ignore the rest of the curve. I think that's a very interesting thing to really study and to look further into. But but uh, in her case, her deformity is just not bad enough. I think. To yeah, yeah, Dean, I I agree with Roger. I, I the first thing I do when I I do all the measurements, I try to figure out what the presenting disability is. Do we have a deformity problem where the patient's out of balance and, and is fatiguing themselves from a, a, some sort of flat back syndrome. If it's more of a ridiculous neurologic problem, I say to myself, how can I do the smallest procedure possible where the patient can compensate if I don't correct the deformity as much as I want to, and especially the elderly, because as you and I know, we don't have to make the numbers perfect in the elderly. They like sort of looking at the ground. They like sort of being a little bit bent over. So it's a small procedure, even though the x-rays may not look great in terms of balance, I think you can probably get away with it the vast majority of time. And the family will thank you and the patient will thank you, uh, avoiding the complications that can arise with a large deformity operation. And there are a bunch of really good questions. So one, one question is, is, is there a role for a T-lift in, in, in this case? Dean, do you, do you, know, do you, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I personally think T-lift would be a great operation also uh, because you get the foraminal decompression, you get the inner body distraction. You know, if, if for some reason this patient had anatomy, say like uh, colon surgery or radiation in the retroperitoneal space, I think T-lift would be a great, op great option for this patient, yes. Even if it's a three level, I mean, I assume there's a two or three level case. Yeah, then I, then I sent him to Roger to do the work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Yeah, but I, I think I think you know when it's that if it's a good point. If it's multiple levels, it's easier to do. I in my hands, it's easier to do the inner bodies anteriorly or lateral, and then do the screws posteriorly. Because for me, a three level T lift is a lot of work, but it certainly can be done. 15 hours, five hours plus five. You, Alex does it in 45 minutes. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, yeah, I should send him to Alex and make it go faster. Then. No, no, I, I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> a multi-level T-lift is a lot of work. It's, it's a, so I, and it's morbid. I'm a big fan of indirect decompression. And, and you, you had a great slide. I didn't even know that that literature existed where it's not the size of the cage. It's a change in disk space height minus your cage height. And, and I, I, th I think what you said, I, 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 Dean, there wasn't an absolute number. It's just the larger the magnitude of the difference. There's no, like, it has to be two to three millimeters, right? It just has to be a, a sizable difference. Is that what you concluded? Exactly, yeah. You know, I, I think that's a, that's a great thing. And I, and I like the fact that you follow the MRI out, look at the dorsal root ganglion. And that's, a, that's the first thing I, I teach the fellows to do. I look at the central stenosis and look at the transaxials. And then I say, okay, now look at the T1 sagittals and follow the nerves out. And then all of a sudden the answer is there. And I like the fact that you went even further and you did selective nerve root injections and, it, and, you, and they were reproducible. So you just didn't do it once. So um, I'm hoping you just did a two to four fusion, but we'll see. Yeah, that that anytime I see, I, I agree with you, Alex. Same time, anytime I see a scoliosis, the very first thing is I look at those foramen. Now here, Fernando from Uruguay, he's asking, is indirect decompression enough? How do you know that indirect decompression in this case is going to be enough? Uh, a great, a great question. I think that I, I think that one one metric that I use is I mean, if I know I jack up those spaces really well, or if, if it's if it's a scoliosis and you you straighten out that concavity, uh, even if it's, even if just you make it level, I think a lot of times those patients do really, really well. If there's a lot of central stenosis, I, I generally don't trust it and I will decompress the patient in the back if there's severe central stenosis. So, so here's the next question, Dean, and I think someone will probably ask this. What do you think about standalone lateral with or without a plate? So I have never been a big fan of that because I just, I like to have a tension band. I mean, I, I came from the era of the early 90s where we did cages without pedicle screw fixation and that failed. Anytime you give a tension band, uh, when you distract on the anterior annulus, I think I usually find it to be more effective. So I'm not a standalone multi-level lateral surgeon. I, I think it's foolish. Would you ever consider it? Uh, I, I generally don't. I agree. I do. I do think that that there are there are certain cases. Let's say the patient is so sick they can't tolerate the posterior screws, and they can only tolerate that. And, you know, you got to get them off the table in an hour, and you just do one inner body. 
But I think most people, I think given the, the technology of percutaneous screw fixation, that's so little morbidity, it's just more anesthesia time with little blood loss. I think it's probably better just to stabilize the bag. Yeah, I think the, yeah, we, we looked at that for excellence, like for adjacent segment disease. And, and uh, uh, first of all, the standalone, the fusion rate is lower. And, and that has really been shown in multiple publications. And then the lateral cages biomechanically are not as stable as pedicle screws. Plus, plus you can, I mean, the lateral plates, plus, plus you can get fractures. So I, I don't do, I used to, I mean, I, I don't use lateral plates anymore, especially now that you can do single stage surgery. It's so easy to put in. I, I prefer unilateral pedicle screws over a lateral plate. So, so it's so easy to put it in in a lateral position now, so. Yeah, I, I think given technology and how fast it is to do MIS pedicle screws, I agree. And any thoughts about cage width? You talked about looking at the, the difference in height, but you know my, my experience is, and we published that, is that the width of the cage is also, and, and Louis Pimento obviously published that as well, that the, the width is really more important than the height. Any, any thoughts about that? Yeah, that's what I've heard also. I've heard that the, the, the width is really critical. Um, I think the, the thing to keep in mind when thinking about the width is the patient anatomy and the corridor that you're working through. Um, you know, if you got a great huge corridor, I think go for the big cage, but if, if it's very narrow and you're at four or five and you're not sure where the plexus is, then I, I tend to use a smaller one. Uh, last question, just because Fernando, he's asking that question, and, and that's something that I've been struggling with also. You know, indirect decompression for foraminal stenosis, especially at 5.1, sometimes you see these patients have like these osteophytes in the foramen, right? And it almost looks like if you put a cage in uh, anteriorly or laterally, you're just going to lift everything up. But you're not really going to decompress the nerve. Do you have any, what, what, what are your thoughts about that? Is there ever a, a scenario where you see an osteophyte in the foramen and then you're not gonna rely on indirect decompression. You really wanna go in there and decompress the nerve. Yeah, I've, I've had a few failures of the, of the indirect, indirect decompression, especially at 5.1 where they're still, they still have pain. And, I, and I, sus, I suspect that what Fernando's talking about is a very real phenomenon that you're not able to just lift it off. Yeah, so and that's a great question. So. Roger, um, I've had cases like that before. So I take us back to the original um, anterior cervical literature that said if you stabilize an anterior cervical interspace, the osteophytes will melt away. Remember that back in the 1970s and 80s, the papers that came out. And I would always laugh and say, well, I don't, I don't really trust that. So I do an aggressive foramenotomy. I've gone in when I haven't gotten a CAT scan and I've done procedures on patients and they've had a radiculitis after surgery and I've gotten a CAT scan. I'm, I'm like horrified that I see like ossification between the disc space and the posterior elements or an osteophyte with a superior articular process as a big osteophyte in the frame. And I'm like, I can't, I have to like actually go in there and decompress that. But if you provide stability, it's interesting. I didn't take these people back. I showed them the imaging studies. And over time, their symptoms improved because there was lack of motion. So I think if you elevate it a little bit and take motion away, it may make some of those patients feel better. That doesn't answer the question, if you know about it a priori, should you go in and decompress? But I think if you elevate it a little bit and provide stability, you may get some relief. It's just using, using the, what we know about the cervical region. Right. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's probably what happens because you would expect this to be a complication much more frequently. People rarely talk about it. So yep. I assume that that's probably what's happening, All right? So exactly what I did, uh, I included a four or five just because there's severe L4 for animal stenosis also. Here's the, here's the, uh, the uh, intraoperative pictures, here's mm -hmm. the navigation, uh, uh, learning from, from Roger to use navigation instead of blasting myself with radiation. You can see the disc height change on each of those. You can see the very left image. You can see how much height change we have in each of those um, uh, after each of those graphs. So we were very happy that because there was such significant height change, we were comfortable not decompressing in the back. And then we just uh, put- Dean, Dean, why did you go to four? I, I thought three, four was okay. It was uh, uh, There was severe for uh, L4 for oh, animal Was there? Also. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and I think that part of her, her pain was, all, it was a lot of L4 also. That, that's why I went to L4. But, but yeah, that, and you can see the, uh, the height was good. 
And then, then we just we just put screws in the back and that was it. And then this is what she looks like. And here's what's very interesting is if you look at her immediate post-operative x-ray, this is in the hospital. You see how kyphotic she is. And, and people say, man, she looks worse. Yeah. But you see what happens when you're post-op and she gets back and stands up straight. So I think that's something to always keep in mind that your immediate post-operative x-ray, pa patients are in a lot of pain. Uh, you know, there's no decompression, no laminectomy, there's more lordosis, but they look terrible because of the, the pain that they're in from the surgery. And you can see, um, this is one year, you can see how she could restore it back to, um, you know, back to her sagittal alignment. Oh, that's great. Did you say that you use navigation for the lateral surgery? Uh, yeah, navigated the, I navigate the lateral, I navigate it, I navigate everything, the back too. Once you put a cage in, don't you lose accuracy for the rest of the cages? Or you? Uh, uh, yeah, if you put it on the crest, then you put you put your uh, most distal one first, and then work towards the reference arc. Right. Yeah. And then you, I mean, I, I've I've tried doing lateral surgery with navigation. I I just get nervous because it it you know it it loses a few millimeters very quickly. Uh, but but you you find it still reliable enough. You you don't have fluoroscopy in there just in case. Uh, well, I, I take a CR shot at the end to confirm. Yeah, All right. to make sure. Yeah, yeah, but but it should theoretically still be okay for each level because it should push away from the pelvis. That's true. If you start distally, then yeah, that's cool. There are a few questions here. Uh, do you use typically uh, more pre-sores versus transsores, and how do you choose, Dean? Uh, I, I personally do all pre um, and I, I know that there are people who are really, really good trans surgeons and, and, and do a great job. So I personally do, do pre but I think the most important is what you're comfortable with. Dean, have, have you ever um, gotten confused on a pre approach and you didn't drop your hand enough and the cage is very oblique or maybe entered into the canal on the contralateral side? Uh, yeah, so sometimes you can't drop it enough and uh, it ends up oblique. So what, in those cases, I just leave a shorter cage. I try not to cross all the way to the other end. Yeah. And uh, how do you decide peak versus titanium now? You know, a lot of these cages now are titanium, right? Yeah, I heard titanium is, is the, the better product. So I think that, you know, I think that, you know, having that end plate in growth, uh, but right now, the you know I've I've just been using peak, but I, I think that uh, titanium may be a better option eventually. I don't know. What do you guys think? What do you guys think of titanium versus peak? I'm going to give you my strong bias. I don't like anything you can see, because uh, the the thing that nauseates me more the bullet titanium cages where people put one in and it's on the far right or far left, and I'm like that that can't heal. So when they come to see me for a second opinion, I see this like little metal cage into the left. So when you have peak cages, you can't even see it. So I'm not nauseated. So I've always grown over the last 30 years having invisible interbody implants so I don't vomit when I see my post-op x-rays. So I'm hoping that they make a biomaterial that's good, as good as peak, so I don't get nauseous in the perioperative period. <laughs> All right, and then Imran has a comment. Alex, in my own experience, as well as those of close colleagues, the radiation exposure in l -lifts, so lateral surgery, far exceeds the extent of exposure with T-lifts. Navigation technique for l -lift isn't as well developed as with T-lifts. So, uh, so that, is, that, is that something you consider, uh, um, uh, Alex? Yeah, yeah, so I, I totally agree. My radiation exposure is for my lateral approach. I do a lot of laterals also, and I, and I, I, I feel my groin is getting radiated. I, ha I have it on. Um, and I am concerned about the lateral approach. Now, I haven't used navigation for lateral. And you, you both do. And I think it's probably a great idea. I only navigate posteriorly, but I've never done it for lateral. But I am concerned. Um, I am concerned. Right. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, Dean, the navigation, is there a difference between oblique versus transsource? Or do you think you could, it would work for you for either one? Oh, yeah. It's the same. It's the same. It's the same equipment. So it's exactly yeah. the same, no difference. Just put a put a pit in the crest and then everything else just navigate down and just so you don't, so you're at a perfect angle. Dean, I was listening to what you said. So when you're navigating, you said you do the distal first and you work work towards your antennas. 
Is that what you uh, said? Uh, right. Well, the, 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 the reference arc is placed distally in the ilium. So you're actually working proximally or far away from the proximal location, but distal from the reference arc. And then you work towards a reference arc. Is that what you said? Yeah. yeah. And, it, and that tends to minimize the variance. Uh, right, because you should, you theoretically should not, if you're doing L, L2, 3, 3, 4, and 4, 5, theoretically should not be affected. Gotcha. All right. Uh, so, guys, uh, we have 10 more minutes. Uh, should I show another case? Sure. Yeah. yeah. I want to get uh, Alex an opportunity to trash me completely. <laughs> <laughs> I would never do that. So, so this is a case we did a few weeks ago. This is a lady who came in. She's 81 years old. She, uh, uh, she had a lumbar laminectomy done about 10 years ago by somebody else, a chronic, chronic foot drop. She saw me because she had weakness in her left groin, left thigh. So she has L3, L4 weakness, could hardly walk. Very nice lady. She, uh, she worked, she was like 80 years old. She was in the, in the, in the Israeli military and then she was a model and then she got married to a very, uh, you know, interesting guy who's an art collector. She lives on the Upper East Side. She can hardly walk now for the last two months. So she comes in with these x-rays here. She's got spondylolisthesis at L4-5, grade two spondylolisthesis, grade one spondylolisthesis at L L3-4. She's got collapse of the disc space at L5-S1, but no nerve compression at that level. Uh, Roger, can you make it bigger on, on full screen? Oh, yeah, I'm Our, sorry, uh, yeah. Slide, please, slide show. Yeah, yeah so, uh, you see that? Yeah, so, sorry. So she's got uh, the, the spondy at L4, 5, L3, 4. She's got collapse of the disc space at 5, 1. You can see the laminectomy defects here from her previous laminectomy. And then I, I can kind of show you the MRI scan here. But basically, she's got significant foraminal narrowing on the, especially she got central stenosis here and then severe foraminal narrowing, especially on the left side at L3-4 and L4-5. You see that. Roger, you want me to take a shot at it? Yes. Are, are you done with all your cases? What do you mean? The, all the images you made. <laughs> so so um, let me make, let me make some, some yeah. several comments. I like the fact that you didn't fall into the let me show you the EOS because in any other course today, you would show me the EOS with 17 measurements, PI minus LL, you know, TI pelvic incidence and stuff like that. So you're, you're showing a case the way most of us would look at a case. So the first thing in this case, I'd say to myself is, do I have any concern about foraminal narrowing at the L5 S1 level? You did not make a case for that. You made a case for three, four, and four, five. So in this particular case, if I did not think, What's that, Raj? No, I'm just sorry. Five one is not so bad on the right. Yeah, not so bad. And I like the fact that it's collapsed, and I like the fact it's abstract. So this would be an a mini open T lift at three four and four five in my hands, and I'd only fuse from three to five. I would ignore the disc degeneration at five one, um, but then again, I would be concerned about a balance. I'd have to see it. if she if she looked funny clinically. I would then get an AP lateral scoliosis X ray and say, do I have to be much more aggressive? Because if I really want to give lordosis to someone. I am going anteriorly at L5, S1 because the vast majority of lordosis, 60% is between L4 and S1. But in this case, this is a two level T-LIF, three, four, and four, five. Yeah. Um, uh, Dean, do you wanna, you wanna give it a try? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think, I think the, the, the foraminal stenosis is the big deal. One thing that I have changed my practice in with these older patients is actually going back to old school posterior lateral fusion also no inner body uh, with these old people. So one thing that I would do is I would go in there, completely whack off the facets on the, uh, or, you know, make sure that those nerves are decompressed on the right side. And if there was complete room for those nerves on the right side, just by whacking it, the, the facets off and doing a fusion, I would just stop. But if there was significant bone on bone pedicle onto the disc, then I would consider the inner body. Um, but a lot of times I've just gone back to, uh, to not even doing inner body, just to standard old school posterior lateral fusion, a lot of these older patients. Yeah. And, and I certainly thought about that, especially L4-5. I mean, she's 81 years old, you know, she's not like, 
you know, I, I think that that would, I certainly consider, especially if she's totally collapsed at four or five, I thought maybe I'll just put in screws there without an interbody cage. But here, this is really, you know, she had, uh, she had quadriceps weakness on the left side, which is really that foramen here. You can see that it's, it was almost like a soft disc herniation. And I think that's very important to take into consideration that it was really the, the goal of the operation was to decompress that foramen on the left side. And at 045, obviously, was also very collapsed. And 51 wasn't that bad. So, yeah, so I decided to do a, uh, an MIS T lift uh, at both levels. I don't do, I, I don't know how to do an open T lift. So I, I didn't even have the option that Alex, you know, mentioned. Uh, and for, for me, I mean, I do so much tubular surgery. I mean, it's so easy to drop a tube. I know where, I know much better where I am when I drop a tube than, than without it. And, uh, but I put in the screws first and I'll just walk you through the uh, navigation images here. So I don't use the robot, I use active navigation and that allows you that, you know, you can put the screws, but the, then you can't in between, you can use the probe to just figure out where you are. And in this particular case, that was really helpful. And then this is for the bone graft and then this dropping the tube. So you can see I'm, I'm on the muscle fascia here. I wanna dock the tube here on the left side over that facet joint. So I determined that trajectory with the navigation and I used the finger to dilate down and then I dropped the tubular, the, the dilators and, and I dropped the tube and then I put the tube down. And then I used the tube, I, I used navigation then through the tube to find the interface between the scar tissue, the, the bone and, and, the, uh, and, and the dura or the scar tissue. So that, that's actually for redo cases. That's something with a robot you can't really do because the robot is good for the screws, but then you can't use active navigation. So, and then, uh, you know, we put in the cage at L45, uh, that went pretty straightforward and uh, put the cage in at both levels. And I, I got another spin for the next level because uh, we put in four five. So the navigation was at that point was a little bit off. And, uh, and then we got uh, the films at the end. And, uh, you know, in these cases, if you get a CSF leak, I wanted just to bring that up. You can definitely fix it through a tube. And, and Dean, Dean wrote that up. He, ha he has a technical report on, on using uh, various instruments to do that. There's, a, there's an endoscopic dual repair set uh, that uh, Rick Fessler told me about that I've been using for the last 10 years. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. I put cement in because she had, you know, a little bit of osteopenia so I just, I didn't want to take a chance. And those, those, those were her uh, films. So we got a, you know, we got a relatively, relatively nice restoration of her lumbar lordosis. And, uh, uh, you know, she's, she's, her weakness got better on the left side. So, you know, she's been very happy. So, so we'll see how she does long-term. That's great, Raj. Yeah. Yeah, that's a nice, uh, nice result. There's a question for you, Roger. Uh, yeah. What about a two level lateral and perk screws? Yeah, you know, I didn't show all the films, but she, she had that Mickey Mouse configuration at 045. Plus she had a grade two spondy and she had a lot of calcified vessels. So I, I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna, you know, I, I didn't think that at, with that degree of spondy, I'd really be able to put in a cage there safely. And, 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 and I also with that degree of, you know, the goal was really to decompress that L3-4 nerve, that, that L3 nerve. And I, and I thought that, that would be better done with a direct decompression. You know, that was the whole goal of the operation. I didn't want to rely on indirect decompression and then, and then, and then we've got to go back and, and do a direct decompression because for whatever reason that didn't work. She had so much disc material there, you know? That's so great. Anyways, so, that's, no. so thanks. So any final questions or comments? Um, so thank you know, thanks Alex, thanks Dean uh, for being here tonight. Uh, Dean, hopefully you'll, you'll get a nice dinner now. Alex, you probably had dinner already, but uh, uh, I just want to make everybody aware. Yeah, first of all, if you uh, if you're still here, uh, please fill out the evaluation questions. Uh, so rate the overall agreement with the following statement: the registration process for the webinar was straightforward. You disagree, you strongly disagree, neutral agree, strongly agree. Just go through this, uh, except for us faculty, we can't vote. 
but everybody else, please go through that. Also keep in mind that there are a bunch of AO Spine North America webinars coming up, April 28th, Strategies for Fixation of Osteoporotic Bone. That's a very uh, important topic. Uh, adolescent Spinal Deformity on June 16th. October 6th, Treatment for Cervical Radiculopathy. December 8th, Lumbar Pelvic uh, Injuries. Also want to make you aware that with the AO uh, uh, North America, we work on a series of courses for uh, MIS uh, over three months. In the latter part of this year, we're going to have like probably on every Wednesday, a webinar like this where we talk about MIS topics, followed then at the end of those three months with a practical, uh, either with real spine or with cadavers, an in-person course somewhere where we uh, do all these procedures then in cadavers or with surgical simulation. So keep keep an eye out for that. Uh, hopefully that'll be announced uh, within the next few months. And um, and other than that, I, I wanna wish everybody good night. Uh, Chris, thanks for uh, walking us through all this. And Ron, thank you for being here as well. And uh, we'll see you hopefully soon and safe in the post pandemic world at the next meeting. Thanks Raj. Mm -hmm.